Hello world, it's me again. It's been a month since April's TBR video and what do we have as a result? Today it's 8th of May and I finished two and a half books from the TBR list. The Outsider and The Airport, as well as one audiobook that wasn't in the list and seven volumes of the Promised Neverland manga series. Does it also happen to you that when you just set the reading plans, they always go sideways. You don't, like, the next day you don't want to read the books you choose or planned, or during this time you suddenly overwhelmed with everything else in your life and there's no time to read. Well, something like that happened to me as well. I was hoping to read a lot during the vacation and then I just decided to shut down my brain and enjoy and relax and have some quiet time. But I'll just make new plans for May, move on, because I'm reading for fun and pleasure. Two books out of seven is actually not a bad result. And percentage-wise, my yearly TBRs are usually less successful. So let's talk about books. The first book I want to talk to you about is The Outsider or The Stranger by Albert Camus. I shared my initial thoughts about it in April's TBR. I'll link it in the description below so you can check it out. The book was written by Albert Camus in early 1940s in the occupied France. It was published in 1942 without censorship or omission. The Outsider is considered a classic of 20th century literature. It was several times adapted into films as well as reference in different media. The most curious fact that I found is that there is some kind of retelling of this story from the perspective of unnamed Arab man's brother, written by Kamel Daoud. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing the name wrong. And the novel is called The Mersault Investigation. I don't know if the novel is any good, but for me it feels like, from the perspective of the writer, it's amazing. Someone was inspired by your story, by your book so much, that they wanted to spend more time in it. They wanted to invest their time to expand your universe. Let me know if you watched any adaptations or read the retelling. So what do I have to say about the book after I finished reading it? Well, until the very end, the sense of strangeness, of absurdity didn't leave me. Everything that was happening was wrapped with that strangeness, with character, had his existential crisis, or in general was weird. Somehow in a lot of books lately I stumble into a situation when I catch myself thinking that that couldn't have happened. No one would act like that in real life. Or this sequence of events is not believable. The author put them together just to fit the story. And either I'm deliberately searching for that or I read enough stories just to spot them easily. But it happened several times to me lately. The whole book is hardly believable sequence of events, and I had to read some parts aloud, not to lose the sense of what's going on. Nevertheless, it made me think about life, freedom, societal judgment, and what it means to be different. I'll talk about my thoughts throughout the reading process, and if you don't want to get any spoilers, please skip to the next part. Timings are in the description below. Let's start from the beginning. Chapter 1 with funerals. In every scene, I feel Mersault's discomfort. The discomfort of being there at the funeral, discomfort from observing the people around, the discomfort of being in his skin, his clothes. It feels like he wants to disappear. He's so cold, not just detached. I can and at the same time cannot understand his joy of getting into the bus and going back to his routine. It's, of course, a stressful event, the funerals, and everybody would want it to be over. But it's it's his mother. I would expect him to be more disturbed by this whole business. As we see, the old people in the house are more invested in his mom's life, and also in his mom's death. I was surprised by the question about his mom's age that he failed to answer. I will read the quote. Was she old? I answered, fairly because I didn't know exactly. I mean, 
how 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 can you not know plus minus a year or two but how far and how wrong can your guess be another quote that grabbed my attention was from the warden and the way he twisted his sentence you see she had friends here people of her own age she could share her interest with them you're a young man a different generation and she must have been bored living with you i really like that not the other way around it feels like a reproach like a poke that he doesn't have friends of his own age or his own interests in chapter two my questions are growing in numbers why is he justifying himself in front of his boss even if it's only in his head mother's death is a valid reason not just to take a few days off but also fall apart completely fall into a depression or at least cry for a week instead he decides to go to swim and flirt with his ex-girlfriend okay another quote that i wrote down into my notes she wanted to know when meaning when the mother died so i said yesterday she recoiled slightly but made no remark i felt like telling her that it wasn't my fault but i stopped myself because i remember that I had already said that to my boss. It didn't mean anything. In any case, you are always partly to blame. That's a tricky one, about the fault and the blame. And it feels like it's not only addressed to Marceau, but also addressed to the reader to think about it. Are we to be blamed for anybody's death? Or could we avoid that by doing something right right now? A few times we hear about Marceau's exercise book, full of things that amuse him. Is it some kind of his link to this world? He's surprisingly observant for the man who doesn't care. There was also a great sentence describing the relationship between Mersault's neighbor and his dog. They've been together for eight years. Sounds sweet until we see the relationship itself and how abusive they are. I think that was for the chapter three. Why his neighbor would want his advice, what makes him his neighbor think that Merceau is knowledgeable or people around him in the house in the city are so much more miserable so much more broken that he's like a high class among them I don't think so this asking for advice neighbor is Raymond a typical tyrant and abuser who says I love you but you deserve to be beaten why is this dude mad what did his girlfriend do to deserve all these angry, vindictive thoughts? A quote. He wanted to write her a letter which would really hurt and at the same time make her sorry. Then when she came back, he would go to bed with her and right at the crucial moment he would spit in her face and throw her out. I think that man is definitely sick. Though the main character is as sick because he decides to support his punishment business. And another quote. I did my best to please Raymond, because I had no reason not to please him. I mean, what? Since when the default option is to please someone, unless otherwise? And that means he supports such harsh behavior against women, since this story of vindictiveness is not a good enough reason not to please Raymond. Chapter 4. He told Marie, his now girlfriend, who was ex colleague everything about the old man but why didn't he tell her everything about Raymond's letter and punishment idea he's a coward is there any parallels between the neighbor with the dog and the one who wanted to punish his mistress it's like mistress masters both abusers and again the neighbor the dog owner is asking about his opinion how Mersault would know what the police would do to a dog at the police station if he doesn't have a dog and he's not working in the police. Chapter 5. Another quote. He, in this case the boss. He then asked me if I wasn't interested in changing my life. I replied that you could never change your life. That in any case one life was as good as another and that I wasn't at all dissatisfied with mine here. What an interesting belief. He should watch some YouTube videos, like change your life in one week or something. Maybe that would help him. I can agree with his boss. 
He has no ambition, he evades the questions, and that's disastrous in the business world. Oh yeah, another great event of this chapter, Marie proposed. And Marceau said yes. I don't know why. He doesn't love her and says that it doesn't matter. So, whew, they're all crazy and absurd in this book. Even after hearing that, she still wants to marry him. Chapter 6. Another quote. For the first time, perhaps, I really thought I'd get married. He thinks that after seeing another person's marriage for a second, is that, is that it? You never saw any other family before to make that resolution? And another quote, which finally some smart one. The time to have lunch was when you felt hungry. Somehow I thought that the initial funeral event was a huge part of the book, that it was something big. But it's the middle of the book and we barely see it mentioned anymore. Only some tiny bits here and there, mostly about sun's morning. A relatively peaceful scene with swimming turned into an action movie in one page. Though Raymond in this case is more important as a character since it's his problem. Fight, knife, blows. I didn't make as much notes about the second part of the book. At first I was too shocked by the senseless murder and I was waiting for some explanation why there were five shots. Was it revenge for a friend? Nervous breakdown? Then I realized there would be no explanation. There could be none with a character like that. Second part of the book focuses on the trial process, highlighting society's reaction to Merceau's behavior and personal beliefs rather than actually focusing on the murder. And we don't even see anybody caring about the dead man. This for all my notes. If something resonated with you, I'd be glad to discuss it in comments. Meanwhile, we are moving to the airport. The second book from my April TBR by Arthur Haley. I've heard a lot of reviews praising author's books and describing him as a master of occupational novels. Now, after finishing the book myself, I can only agree with this opinion. Throughout the whole book, I felt like I was a part of the airport or airline crew. I listened to this book in Audible, and I must compliment the narrator, B.J. Harrison. He did a great job by building up pressure at crucial moments by finding the right speed and tone. I don't have as many notes about the airport as I had about The Outsider, but there are some moments that I want to mention. The book was written and published in 1960s, times of significant development in aviation industry, when jet aircrafts were introduced, and international travel was becoming more and more popular. Even though it's a work of fiction, I can't imagine how much time Arthur Haley had to spend at an airport to absorb and collect such intricate data. The book feels very realistic. In addition to the feeling of being in part of an airport crew, this book gave me an understanding of how much happening behind the scenes. When each passenger is thinking of their own comfort, the airport and airline crews have to think of and manage everybody's comfort and safety. It's insane how much logistics it requires to run an airport. I like the circular structure of the book. We start with Mel, the manager of the airport, and we end with Mel. I also enjoyed the evolution of Mel's brother, Keith. We see how tough, complicated, and life-changing his job as a traffic controller is. We think that all the action happens in the air, but there is so much planning that's happening in the controller's room. Each character in this book has a distinctive feature, background, and an important role in this story. They provided a glimpse into different aspects of the industry. The book covers less than a day, and it keeps you engaged all this time. Let me read you a quote the idea mentioned in it never came to my mind, but now, thinking of it, it explains so much. It's Mal speaking. Unfortunately, it's a good many places. All our early airports were imitations of railway stations, because designers had to draw on experience from somewhere, and railroad experience was all they had. Afterward, the habit remained. It's the reason nowadays we have so many straight-line airports, where terminals stretched on and on, and passengers must walk for miles. I can only imagine how hard it is to plan an airport and accommodate for the future load increase and so on, but it feels that even in the newly built airports right now, this idea of airport being a replica or imitation of the railway station still stays. There are two newly built airports that I've been to, 
in Berlin and in Istanbul. And Berlin is slightly more minimalistic in that sense, but the one in Istanbul looks more like a shopping mall that also provides aviation services and wants to get all your money rather than being designed for people. I think I had a short video of it, so if I have it, I'll put it for you to see. Anyway, back to the book. There was an adaptation of this book right after it was published. I didn't have a chance to watch it yet, but I checked the posters of the movie and saw the portraits of the actors. They are so neatly picked to match the characters, it's amazing. Even though the ratings on Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb are not so great, I still want to watch it. That were all my thoughts about Airport for now. Let me know if you read Airport or if you like occupational novels in general. Maybe you can recommend me another author who is great in this genre. The third book that I want to talk about today is called The Last of the Moon Girls. I didn't write a writer here. Wow. I'll add the writer here. <laughs> I don't know what made me pick that book. I listened to it in Audible. And from the title and the first few chapters, I thought that it might be some kind of a fantasy. But no, there was no magic, at least no big magic, just some special senses, but they didn't affect the story that much. It was an easy to follow book, maybe that's why my brain picked it up. When we finally got to the troubles part, it was too predictable who'd done the thing, except maybe for some detailed reason of why, but character-wise you can almost clearly point out who that was. So the mystery part wasn't the best. Instead, I enjoyed the other ideas that the author tried to put into the book. For example, finding yourself, forgiving, moving on with your life, and creating your own history, instead of blindly following the outdated family traditions. It was cute. The journey of the main character, Lizzie, to find peace with herself, was the main reason for me to finish the book. Though again, this book gave me the same feeling that I've mentioned while talking about The Stranger. At some moments, I thought that these events were brought together to just glue the story. I'll explain. Lizzie is a successful creative director in a perfume company in New York. One day she receives the news about her grandmother's death. She comes back to her hometown, Salem Creek, and that brings up a lot of stories from the past, as well as decisions that she needs to make now. Lizzie inherited books with the life stories of her ancestors, as well as some notes from her grandmother, Althea, so we see those notes as a separator between the events in the present time. In a few chapters, the notes from Althea knowingly matched the events that Lizzie was going through. It felt like grandmother predicted everything, even the timing when it will happen, so that she can match when Lizzie would read it with the, some wise advice of how to deal with it. I think I would like it more if those notes would be in a more random order. That would make it look like she thought of everything, fine, she can be wise enough, and she probably also thought about her life and how, what can happen in the future, but it wouldn't feel like she's predicting the future. That's my five cents about this book. The last thing that I want to talk to you about today is the Promised Neverland manga series. A long time ago, I watched the first season of the anime based on this story. Then it disappeared from my radar. And then in 2021, I found it in my library application, Libby, and decided to start reading it. I read, I think, seven volumes by then. And then the other volumes weren't available in my library. And recently, I started to browse around in the application again and I saw that one of them was available, I went to check, and all the volumes are now available. So I decided to continue while there's such a good opportunity, and I read the next seven volumes by now. Each volume is about 200 pages, so they're quick to read. I don't know how to talk about this without spoilers, but I'll try. I'll read the names, though. The story is written by Kaiyu Shirai, and illustrated by Pasuka Demizu. I hope I have some close resemblance to how those names should be pronounced. It's all happening in the dystopian universe. The story revolves around a group of orphans at the Grace Fieldhouse. 
they live comfortably there, uh, taking care of each other, sharing the chores, studying hard. They live under the care of a woman whom they call Mama. From time to time, one of the children is taken away to a foster family, or at least they think so at that moment. One day, a little girl who's been adopted forgets to take with her her favorite plush bunny, and two grown-up kids decide to run to the gate and give it to her. The things they discover there, that their home is a farm, raising human children to be fed to demons, change everything in their life. Now they have to figure out a way to escape and survive. The themes of freedom, survival, ethical compromises, human rights, as well as human trafficking, are deeply explored in this story. Covered with children's faces and imaginary demons, the story engages you in a deeply emotional journey where you always crave to know what's going to happen next. I wouldn't go deep into details yet. I think I'll give it another big review when I will finish all the volumes. If you've never heard about this manga series before, definitely check it out. These were all the books I wanted to talk to you about today. I hope you will pick one of them as your next read. Let me know what you think about these books, and I'll see you in the next videos. Bye!